try this again. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Good morning, and welcome to worship at Grace Lutheran Church. Whether you're joining us in person or online, your presence strengthens Christ among us, and we're so glad you're here. Um, during this remaining season of Easter, starting this morning, we're shifting our focus from our wandering hearts, when the heart wandered all around the sanctuary during Lent, to our loving hearts. And we're going to be basing our reflections on the book of 1 John, which is a wonderful book all about God's boundless love for us, as can be seen through the death and resurrection of Jesus. If you haven't read it, or if, you have, if it's been a while since you've read the book of 1 John, I would encourage you to read it. It's a wonderful little book. A couple of announcements this morning. Scuba VBS registration is open. Last summer, the kids went to outer space. Now, apparently, they're going um, under the sea. These kids really get around. So the dates are June 24th through June 28th. If you have children or grandchildren and want to have them signed up, I, I encourage you to sign up. Today, at 1130, there's a volunteer planning meeting that Karen Janik is going to run at 1130 for any volunteers that are interested just to kind of brainstorm how we're going to do it this year. So if you're interested, see Karen and come back at 1130. Discover Grace, our new member gathering for anyone interested in membership, is going to be on Sunday, April 28th at 1130. And then rebuilding together our annual work, um, work day when we help rehab a house in the area is April 28th at, from 8 until 2. So if you're interested, see either Matt Osegard or Karen Janik for additional information and to volunteer. And then finally, during this Easter season, we are going to be using some new music. We're going to be using setting 8 from the hymnal for our liturgies. And since it's new to the congregation, Lisa and Mike, and oh, by the way, Mike, uh, I'd like to welcome back Mike Surratt, our uh, guest organist today. Lisa and Mike are going to give you a quick little tutorial on a few of the things from setting eight. So we're going to look at the, this is the feast, the hymn of praise, and we're also going to look at the gospel acclamation so we can feel bold when we sing um, those portions of our liturgy. We're going to sing from the This is the Feast. Mike's going to play just the refrain um, so we can feel bold on that and then just trust that the Spirit will help us sight read the verses. <laughs> and then we'll also practice the entirety of the gospel acclamation. So I'll invite you to turn to your hymn of praise and Mike will help us learn it. turn to the gospel acclamation. We know setting eight, and we feel ready to sing. Thank you, Lisa and Mike. You all sounded great. We got this. 
Now, let's be in a spirit of worship. I invite you to rise in body or spirit and turn and face the font. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the wellspring of grace, our Easter and our joy. Amen. Amen. Look, here is water. Here is our water of life. Hallelujah. Immersed in the promises of baptism, let us give thanks for what God has done for us. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your voice thundered over the deep and the water became the essence of life. Adam and Eve beheld Eden's verdant were rivers. The ark carried your creation through the flood into a new day. Miriam led the dancing as your people passed through the sea into freedom's land. In a desert pool, the Ethiopian official entered your boundless baptismal life. Look, here is water. Here is our water of life. Alleluia. At the river, your beloved son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, you opened the floodgates of your reconciling love, freeing us to live as Easter people. We rejoice with glad and loving hearts, giving all honor and praise to you, through the risen Christ, our source of living water, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Look, here is water. Here is our water of life. Alleluia. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Holy and righteous God, you are the author of life, and you adopt us to be your children. Fill us with your words of life that we may live as witnesses to the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading comes from the book of Acts. Peter addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you have handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you have acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what has been foretold through all the prophets, that the Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out. Word of God, word of life. And please join with me in the responsive reading of Psalm 4. Answer me when I call, O God, defender of my cause. You set me free when I was in distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. You mortals, how long you will be silent. Know that the Lord does wonders for the faithful. The Lord will hear me when I call. Speak to your heart and silence upon your 
Offer the appointed sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when grain and wine abound. Our second reading comes from the book of First John. See what the love of God has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we, what we will be has not yet been revealed. But we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like Jesus, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him, no one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone does what is right, is righteous just as he is righteous. Word of God, word of life. Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus himself stood among the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Most of you know that Easter is not just a day, but an entire season. As Pastor Terry introduced, and as Pastor Heidi told us this week in her message in the weekly email, the promises of resurrection are so immense and so joyful that it takes us 50 full days as a church to live into them fully. Throughout Lent, our wandering hearts followed Peter's faith journey. And now through the rest of the Easter season, we will turn from wandering hearts to a new theme of loving hearts. We will focus on the lectionary readings from 1 John, the epistle, and look at how love is inspired among us in this community. 
What does love look like in our journeys of faith here? So our text from 1 John today, which is what I'll be talking about, certainly talks about love. The selection of verses for today provides some particularly big promises, things like being called the children of God and being like Christ and what will happen to us when Christ is revealed. But it also seems to warn us of ways of living that can take us away from those promises. At times, to me, it feels a little contradictory. You're the children of God. You live in God and in Christ, and you're pure. Oh, but by the way, if you keep sinning, you are no friend of God. Like, what do we do with that? So today I want to talk about that, about the ability to live the both and of faith, the inevitability of sin, our inclination towards it, and God's ultimate love for us in spite of, or maybe even because of, our inclination to sin. There's this song that we would sing at the church I grew up at during our Easter vigil service, which is my favorite service of the year. It's the great heralding in of our Easter season. The words to it are, we are listening to the stories of our faith as we follow along this journey from death into new life. I'll sing it for you after worship if you ask. The reason I bring it up this morning is because it evokes for me an image that I have always found helpful when I think about a life in faith, a life abiding in Christ. And that image is a journey. We follow along this journey from death into new life. It's like a long dirt road, because I'm from Minnesota, a road where I have no idea the ending. All I know is where I stand, a lot of stuff is gonna happen on the way, and that the way is from death into new life. There are certain things I know for sure on this road. I know that God walks with me. I know I'm gonna try my best to walk with God. I know I am loved. I know I have the hope of the resurrection. I know I am on a journey of faith because of that hope in the resurrection and its promise of new life. And there are certain things I don't know on this dirt road. I don't know everything that is entailed for me in the journey of faith. I don't know exactly who I'll be when I get to the end. I don't know if my journey will be easy. I don't know if I'll trip or stumble or hurt myself or someone else. I don't know if I'll fail. So that's the image I have in my mind when I think of my own faith, my whole life, really. And that's the image I have in my mind when I read this text from 1 John, particularly. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. I wonder if you can think of your own journey of faith in this way. Can you think of the path you've been on? Does it feel comfortable to you? Do you have good walking shoes and water and a granola bar? Is it straight and easy or are there curves and hills that get in the way? Have you always felt God beside you? And what keeps you on that path? What's the thing that's guiding you on your journey of faith. The writer of 1 John gives his own answer. See what love God has given us that we should be called children of God. One commentary I read this week said that, quote, we are God's children not by our choice or by our accomplishment, and I would add, no matter how well we walk that road, but by God's love. For me, that's why I'm on this faith journey. It's by no greater thing than the love and the grace of God that I am where I am. And I lean on the hope of Christ and the promise of forgiveness to keep going when I trip. I just do my best to walk in the direction I think God is leading me. But friends, I can imagine, just based on my own path, which has been at times flat and smooth, and has been at other times, like the hill up to my college, 45 degree angle, 10 blocks, no water breaks, that our faith journeys have probably not always been smooth. You've probably tripped. You've probably been hurt. You have probably tripped or hurt others. I know I have. So what about the part of the faith journey when we fail? What about the part where we leave the path entirely? What about the part where we sin? Like, it's all well and good to talk about this beautiful journey of faith, but we know the reality. It's not easy. 
And we hear everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. I hear that. I don't know about you. I get a little stressed out on my journey of faith. One way to orient ourselves around sin and what it does in our lives is to define sin as something that separates us from God or separates us from Christ or takes us away from our relationship with them. This idea, sin as separation, is an idea that John the Evangelist wrote about in other places. He called it spiritual darkness. And while I don't personally love the dichotomy of light is good and dark is bad, I do appreciate the ability to read this passage through the lens of sin being the thing that separates us, sin being the thing that takes us off the path. Maybe we walk ourselves off the path. Maybe we stumble off the path and we, we don't know that we've done it. Who knows? By our own will or by something else, our journey has a big bump in it. So what do we do when we sin? How do we get back on the path? Are we allowed to? Or is our relationship with God just totally severed? Here's where the cradle Lutheran in me wants to say, nope, you're good, there's grace for that, and dust my hands and end the sermon. But it feels more complicated than that. Because there's this idea floating around in, in certain kinds of Christianity that tells us that it's somehow possible to perfect our faith or to perfect our life with God. And that by achieving some perfect version of ourselves, some ultimately faithful life, we've won, we've reached God, that's the end goal. That only by being ultimately pure, ultimately free of sin, ultimately, life, ultimately righteous, we can have a relationship with God. In our now long drawn out journey metaphor, that by doing so, we'll reach the end of the road and all is perfectly ordered. Our shoes are clean, we're hydrated, our granola bar didn't fall to the ground. Here's what I have to say to that. I think the goal of the journey of faith isn't to be perfect. It isn't even necessarily to try and be perfect or to come close. It isn't actually to avoid sin no matter the cost. Because here's the thing, John, the writer of our text, he's no idealist. I don't think he expects that anyone is able to live completely sinless. He's got to know that it's contrary to human nature or he wouldn't bother including it in so much, so much in his letters and texts. And the good news, at least for me and my journey of faith, is that if John is aware of our humanness, then God is certainly aware of our humanness. God fully accepts our human nature, our inclination to sin, recognizing that it's really, really hard to live a perfect life. And God still calls us beloved. A life in a journey of faith is all about orienting our lives around the fact that mistakes are part of a life lived and a life loved by God that we are human, that sin and separation, they do happen, and that even still, there is grace, and there is love, and there is resurrection over and over again. That's the listening to the stories of our faith part from my song. That's Easter. That's what Jesus came to teach us, to try and try again and to find a place in the ever-evolving journey of the faithful. I know that a life in faith isn't going to be perfect because I haven't been perfect, shock. I've failed and I have run from God, but I keep being pulled back onto the path. I've sinned without knowing it and I've sinned while knowing exactly what I'm doing. I'm both a sinner and still deeply loved and cared for and created by a God who loves me and loves us like a mother day after day after day. I sin because I'm human. But I'm still a child of God because I have been named and claimed by the one who sent her son down to earth to die for my sins. That was a recent story for us. I live a life of faith because I have hope in the resurrection. I do my best to abide in Christ, but I know that I will fail. 
And still I continue to show up for faith and for love and in faith and in love because I trust that God hasn't given up on me yet. And I know that God won't give up on me. God is still on the path with us. That's my good news. God's still asking us to move forward. God's still loving us when we sin and when we are unrighteous and when we hurt each other and when we fail to abide in Christ. God's still there. God's still naming us and claiming us and calling us forward. God's asking us, try again. So as I read this text about sin as lawlessness and being impure and I get a little scared about, I don't think I can do that. I'm trying my best, but it's hard. I wonder what my life, our life here, could look like if we were less concerned about achieving some perfect form of faith or purity and more excited about the transformative experiences that God opens to us along our journeys. I wonder what our lives could look like if we were less fearful about not being perfectly pure or perfectly righteous and instead trusted, it's a big part of faith, trusted that there's grace enough for each of us to try and to stumble off the path and to try again endlessly. I wonder what our lives could look like if we opened ourselves the way that Jesus opened the disciples' minds to the scriptures. If we were ready for what God has in store for us in our journeys of faith. As we read our lectionary texts about love, as we follow along this ever-evolving journey of faith and love from death into new life, we will stray, we will hurt others, we will hurt ourselves, and we will fail. But as long as we keep trying again, as long as we keep doing our best to know God and to abide in Christ, and to love and serve our neighbor, to love ourselves even when we sin, we can trust that there is forgiveness upon forgiveness and grace upon grace for all of us. So keep walking that road. I'll do it too. And open yourself to the way God transforms you on the way. Amen.
Let us join together and confess what we believe with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for prayers. Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fears, let us pray for the church, for the world, and for all those in need of good news. Let us pray. O oh God, our Holy One, you feed our deepest hungers. As we share the holy meal that is the body and blood of Jesus given for us, lead us to share all that we have and all that we find in generosity and in an abundant life. God of grace, receive our prayer. O oh God, our Creator, you bring forth all the life on earth. Calm storms bring water to parched places and protect the climate that this planet will sustain life in all its variety. We are in awe last week at the solar eclipse. Help us be in awe of all the wonders of your creation every day. God of grace. Oh God, our Savior, you offer wisdom and guidance beyond all human knowledge. We pray then that you will instruct lawmakers and judges and elected officials to make decisions grounded in your love and justice, in your care for all people. We pray this especially, that decisions will be made toward those living on the margins of life. God of grace. O oh God, our elder, you care for all your children. Encourage those who are in times of transition, facing the loss of old ways and routines and the anticipating change. Guide those who journey in grief, hope, pain, and uncertainty. Especially we pray for Anne, Susan, Debbie, Al, Bill, and all those on our prayer list. God of grace. O oh God, our center, you bring all people together in you. Help us remember our identity and purpose in our ministry. Move us to love our neighbors as ourselves and to share in beloved community. God of grace. O oh God, our resting place, your son Jesus promised that we are held in your love forever. Remember our beloved who have gone before us in death especially George Brigham, whose life we celebrate this past week. As we remember and share God's love, comfort those who mourn. God of grace. Into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. I invite you to share a sign of God's love and peace with one another. If you're watching online, I would encourage you either now or after worship to reach out to a friend and lo or loved one and share a sign of God's peace.
I invite you to be seated. During this season of Easter, one of the ways we are going to focus on our loving hearts is to be a bit more intentional during our time of generosity and offertory. So friends, here's what we're going to do for the next several weeks. Each week, the ushers will come forward and they're going to be passing out two different things. The first will be our usual offertory plate. And we talked about this in our worship planning meeting. It's over the last several years, as more and more of us have been giving electronically or monthly or in various ways, sometimes passing the offertory plate can seem a little perfunctory perfunctory and it just I know for myself I don't think much of it I just take it and pass it along so starting today I'd like to ask each of us to be a bit more intentional so when the plate comes touch it hold it for a second or two and be intentional about your gifts whether you're putting something an envelope in each day or if you've already given electronically it doesn't matter just be intentional and mindful of the gifts you give every day and throughout the year to the various ministries at Grace. And also reflect on the gifts that are not money-related, the gifts of your time and talent to the various ministries here and out in society and the world. Secondly, as part of our Loving Hearts series, the ushers are going to pass a second plate, and it's going to have little handmade felt hearts in it. We, we started passing these out and touched on it a little bit during Lent, but one of our newest members, Phil Weglars, makes these, and he passes them out to people he meets on the street, just as a way of opening conversation and sharing just a piece of love with somebody and he calls them heartfelt connections and Phil has graciously made a bunch and I would invite you to take one sometime during this week pass it out give it to a friend a neighbor or a complete stranger just as a way of sharing God's loving heart through you with that person and it will probably make that person's day. I can almost guarantee it. And we're going to do that for the next several weeks, so there'll be new hearts each and every week. Thank you, Phil, for the gift of your heartfelt connections, and thank you all for your ongoing support of Grace's Ministries.
Let us pray. Risen one, you call us to believe and bear fruit. May the gifts that we offer here be signs of your abiding love. Form us to be your witnesses in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our true vine. Amen. Please rise in body or spirit. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty, and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of your Savior, of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who, in dying, has destroyed death, and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so, with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with the earth and sea and all their creatures, with the angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed are you, O God of the universe. Your mercy is everlasting, and your faithfulness endures from age to age. Praise to you for creating the heavens and the earth. Praise to you for saving the earth from the waters of the flood. Praise to you for bringing the Israelites safely through the sea. Praise to you for leading your people through the wilderness to the land of milk and honey. Praise to you for the words and deeds of Jesus, your anointed one. Praise to you for the death and resurrection of Christ. Praise to you for your spirit poured out on all nations. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. With this bread and cup, we remember our Lord's Passover from death to life as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will O God of resurrection and new life, pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Bless this feast. Grace our table with your presence. Come, Holy Spirit. Reveal yourself to us in the breaking of the bread. Raise, up, raise us up as the body of Christ for the world. Breathe new life into us. Send us forth, burning with justice, and with hearts overflowing with love. Come, Holy Spirit. With your holy ones of all times and places, with the earth and all its creatures, with the sun and moon and stars, we praise you, O God, blessed and holy Trinity, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us, using whatever language or version is closest to your heart. Our Father, At Grace, we practice open communion. This is Jesus' table, and all are welcome. There'll be two stations up in front. The ushers will direct you forward. You will be given a wafer, and you may dip that either in the red wine or the clear grape juice. Come, all things are ready.
Please rise in body or spirit. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Shepherding God, you have prepared a table before us and nourished us with your love. Send us forth from this banquet to proclaim your goodness and share the abundant mercy of Jesus, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. The God of resurrection power, the Christ of unending joy, and the spirit of Easter hope, bless you now and always. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.